Hello, everybody. This is Tommy Outdoors, episode 34, Cycling Through Africa with Cuba Standera. Uh, it's an adventure episode. Cuba was already on a podcast on episode 12, uh, where we talked about fishing, um, fishing and angling. Uh, he's a passionate angler um, with many, 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 many years of experience. And he's also an owner of Pirate Lures. Uh, a company that manufactures handmade fishing lures. They are soft plastics for your bass fishing and pike fishing and tuna fishing and what have you. Very good lures uh, for all your fishing needs, okay? Um, so that episode, we ended up uh, teasing a little bit about up-and-coming Cuba's adventure uh, when he was about to jump on his bicycle and cycle right through the Sahara Desert uh, to reach his uh, uh, bucket list fishing destination. Um, so guess what? Kuba is back, and obviously I had to get him on the podcast again and talk about uh, his trip and his great cycling and fishing adventure. So in this episode, uh, we get to hear uh, all the stories about preparation for that trip, what, what went into that, and then stories and adventures while Cuba was cycling through Africa, and finally, once he reached his destination, about fishing there. So that's a very interesting episode, especially if you're into stories and adventures. Oh, one other thing um, worth noting is that the cycle was uh, also a fundraiser for Aware.ie. Uh, Aware.ie is a voluntary organization which aims to assist people who, whose lives are affected by depression. Um, so uh, please uh, visit the where.ie webpage and donate um, if you wish so. So now, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, big adventure and Cuba Standera. And again with me, Kuba Standera. How are you, sir? Ah, oh, very good. Very yeah. good. Right. I'm grand. Right. You're uh you're you're uh you were previously in the episode was it like twelve? Uh it was angling. But now, yep. you know, is you moving beyond angling and it's cycling and it's yeah. adventuring and it's angling in the in the background, all the all yeah, the things. bikepacking. That's that's the thing that I'm into very much now. Bikepacking. You have a new Instagram account actually. Yeah, I started just to separate from uh, fishing business, mm. separate from manufacturing of the lures, and I try to kind of keep my private stuff apart from professional. Yeah, so, that's a good idea. Yeah, uh, kind of. So the old account is uh, fishing related, mm. and pirate lures. Pirate lures, exactly. Yeah, it's all about. Fishing for sea bass, pike, uh, manufacturing lures, new products, and stuff like this. And the new one is just strictly fishing <laughs> and cycling. Good, good. <clears throat> so how's how's the how's the lure going? You have a new new things. Uh, yeah. Are we not giving out any secrets? No. Mm, not yet anything to give. Uh, yeah. I'm working on a new model. Mm -hmm. At this stage, we are waiting for the molds to be done for us. Mm -hmm. It's It just takes ages, you know, right. because it's going to be much more complicated than the previous models. So mm -hmm. we run into some small technical complications. So mm -hmm. we are w waiting for the new molds to be made and we should be ready, oh, I hope, before Christmas. Wow. So very, sure, very soon. Yeah, 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 it's all all designed, all prepared, like... Yeah, all ready to go. We are just waiting for CNC guys to perform their miracles. Right, right. It's awesome, man. And uh, so it's gonna be <clears throat> you're gonna you're gonna publish that posting on on your Facebook account and so on. This is for all you guys who are into fishing, sea bass fishing, and so on. Yeah, as soon as we have the final models ready, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like we've done very extensive testing on the lures during this season. That means that you were just go out fishing. Uh, it's not only me. Few of my friends. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's what I mean. 
Uh, they were testing those. This is this cool part about testing, which we look at testing, but it's not like yeah, a, like a boring, like, boring stuff that you go, go into. Fishing. You, would just, you would just go fishing <laughs> and you have these, all these new lures. And like, what do you do? Yeah, I'm testing lures. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's me working, you know, honey. Sorry, I have to go fishing because, you know, that's you what, understand. That's what, <laughs> it's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. That's what it's all about. That's great. That's one of the big things of turning hobby into a job, right? Yes, but the other thing is sometimes you are a bit overwhelmed. Like, yeah. Uh, Conditions are perfect, but you are sitting mm -hmm. manufacturing them, uh, yeah. working on new designs, uh, kind of compilating all the yeah. data that is coming back to you, all the feedback that's coming back to you from yeah. your testers. Yeah. And trying to put it all together into a new model. Yeah. And can you can you walk can you, can you walk us perfect. can you walk us through it without giving out any obviously any any trade secrets, but how you're uh, how you're uh, modifying what you're doing based on the feedback. So how does it look like? So you you get a feedback. So like, well, that lure is like too heavy, too light. Mm, exactly. Mm. Uh, people are saying, for example, uh, there is not enough flex in the lure. So mm -hmm. what I'm doing, I'm trying to find a different ratio of the plastic, different softness of the plastic. Mm. And I'm sending them lures again. And they are saying like, ah, this time you went a bit too far. It's too soft. So right. maybe try to find something in between okay so again i'm trying to find another plastic mix and like an iterative process go exactly through. then they are saying for example uh we think that a good idea would be to add ice to your lures mm. so it's a major complication when you have to manufacture the mold not from the silicone as usually they are made but mm -hmm. but from aluminium yeah it's uh, machined from aluminium so uh. you have to include this in the cut design Mm -hmm. And then you have to find a person who's able to work on specifics and give you yeah. the details that you are after. Yeah, yeah. Then they are saying, for example, uh, the profile of the lure is great, but we think it's a bit too large. Mm -hmm. The previous one models were 14 centimeters. Mm -hmm. Then I've introduced the 17 centimeters, mm -hmm. which uh, turned out lure, to be a bit... Fish. Yeah, but people were kind of put off by the size of the lure. Oh. Uh, for me, you know, it, it's very simple. Big lure, big fish. Yeah. When it comes to bass, why not? Like 17 mm. centimeters. Yeah. It's not anything huge by any large bass standards. Yeah. So then listening to my customers, I introduced the 11 centimeters model, mm -hmm. which was the smallest one. It was called Baby Treats. Mm. And it turned out to be a huge success. I think that even mm. bigger than the initial model, Bass oh. Street, Baby Treats, they were just slaying fish. Like uh, the feedback I was getting from my testers was like, Whoa, it's amazing. Right. And the same was happening for me in Spain. Mm -hmm. Like the amount and variety of the fish uh, from freshwater bass, largemouth mm. bass, uh, sea bass, all these saltwater fish, uh, you know, it was the heat. Yeah. The only problem was, at least for me, it was tat on the light side. Mm -hmm. It's perfect for, let's say, early spring application. Mm -hmm. When you are fishing over shallow ground, over mm -hmm. shallow reefs, that's a perfect lure. Mm -hmm. but I was looking for something a bit chunky, mm -hmm. you know, kind of um, going back to the initial design of bass streets, which mm -hmm. were 22 grams. The smaller model was 11 grams, so oh. my problem is that uh, I'm using kind of heavy tackle, mm -hmm. heavy braids, uh, heavy rods. Mostly, it's a, it's a weight of the lure itself without without it being rigged with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's just the plastic. Mm. So the previous 22 gram model was excellent for casting. Mm -hmm. The large one was almost 40 grams, so it yeah. was even better. Yeah. Um, you see, my problem is like if you are fishing in Spain. Um, Today you like one cast you are getting sea bass, then you can get a bluefish, then you can get a barracuda, mm. amberjack, mm. Uh, bonito, albacore. You never know what's gonna happen. Mm. So I'm unable to go so light with the tackle as here in Ireland. Yeah, uh, your rods they have to be. So at they least were not working to 60, 80 mm. grams casting weight. Mm. But uh, my friends fishing here in Ireland, they had huge success with baby trees because they were light. They are mm. very slim profile. Right. Uh, they still kept the original action, mm -hmm. colors and everything, so they were quite happy. 
But I decided to try to explore something in between mm -hmm. just to find a better proportion. Yeah. But also because the large model uh, turned out to be quite a good lure for pike, surprisingly for me. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> a few of my friends, they started using it for canal fishing. Yeah. And they were always saying, you know, like, it's really good, but it's that too small for us. You know, 17 centimeters is almost perfect, but 20, 20 mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. be much better. So the new model, it will come in two sizes. One will be for bass and one will be really big for pike. Right. Uh, I think around 10 inches, something like wow. this. Wow. And now you're phasing out the old models? Or you no, 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 no. No, okay. So you're just, just expanding I'm just the offering. just adding new offer. I think that the older models, they are perfect. You mm -hmm. know, like um, the amount of positive feedback I got was just overwhelming. I was really surprised by... Yeah by the variety of fish and conditions like from mm -hmm. portugal spain italy mm -hmm. france holland uh, some parts of poland mm. uh, different fish uh, sea bass uh, largemouth bass yeah uh, bluefish everything everything, everything including swims including freshwater fish like pike and asp yeah asp uh, even asp yeah some guys were trying them for on us. The, on the small ones or on the big ones? Small ones. On the small ones, yeah. yeah. So wow. the variety of fish that can be got uh, mm. with the lure was really surprising. But I just decided, you know, the first small, I was just starting my company. It was mm -hmm. just at the stage of doing you see research, how mm. seeing how it goes, uh, being kind of trying to keep it safe. Yeah, not spending much. <laughs> uh, this time, I thought, you know, if I spend more time on engineering the model, mm -hmm. uh, not only on testing, on doing different mm -hmm. mixes, trying to find the perfect ratio of the plastic yeah. and stuff like this, but also engineering, it might be, you know, a very good idea. Yeah. So I teamed up with uh, my friend. Uh, it's kind of like his hobby. Right. And uh, he helped me to create the model. Mm -hmm. And then he started doing all the anal analysis, like, you know, the aerodynamic, uh, hydrodynamic, how oh. the waves are, you know, like once it's pushing through the water, how the water is working on it. Wow. And then we started doing small tweaks, like, you know, maybe if we made the tail a bit thinner, mm -hmm. it will change the hydroacoustic wave a bit mm -hmm. because he sees this from design, like he's doing, he's able to run the simulation. Yeah. And he sees that, you know, it's changing a lot. Right. So, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be very advanced model. Though we try to keep with the pedigree from... The original bus trees that we are, yeah, we've been doing all the year. Uh, so you're a very successful man. In other yeah. words, are you not? Are you, are you not? Are you not afraid that this this is gonna lose a little bit of a <clears throat> of a you know the charm for the want of a better word of like a handmade lures? Now you're going into like a serious stuff, hydrodynamic analysis of the of the wave and. But how it's it, still handmade. Yeah. Uh, my, oh, of course. my idea is uh, if you have uh, tools yeah. why not to use them yeah uh, it's like like a best of both worlds yeah really. like you can hit the plastic in microwave but it's like insisting that you should start a bonfire outside and hit the plastic <laughs> you know using coal or something like this it doesn't make any sense we have the tools mm. uh, we can work on them we can adjust the design much faster yeah. Uh, the things that we've been running into creating the previous model, Bass mm -hmm. Streets, mm -hmm. uh, various stages of the concept models, mm -hmm. uh, different ideas that we had, mm -hmm. um, different changes that we made to the design. Yeah. Uh, because it was not flying properly, it was not acting in the water properly as we wanted. Yeah. And every time we had to do a new mold, uh, do new testing, order the stuff. Mm -hmm. Now we are just sitting in front of computer and yeah, yeah. trying to adjust everything. Right. So the final model that we'll be getting out hopefully before Christmas mm -hmm. 
I think it's a uh, third model in line. Right. Uh, after all the modifications added, testing testing it with different fish, then modifying again, mm -hmm. then going through the software, then testing again, yeah, going through the software. Process. So how many iterations is usually? How many iterations it takes to develop like a properly develop a lure? It depends because um, like every single model is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, even if I add like if I change the with previous ones, we change the dimension from fourteen centimeters to eleven centimeters. Mm -hmm. They look very same, but they are not the same. Yeah, lure. that changes everything. The right? profile is completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, the ratio between the length and width and uh, mm -hmm. Weight is completely different, mm -hmm. right, right? So even though they look very similar, uh, yeah, it only looks like it's a similar, but because yeah, it, because of a change of the size, everything changes. It, to it looks really almost the same, hmm. but adding or losing 10, 15 percent of the girth of the lure, mm -hmm. um, it changes the perf it changes the performance of the lure drastically, right. dramatically. Right. Like basically you are getting new lure. It behaves completely different yeah. way. It flies completely different way. Yeah. Now, thanks to the uh, software support, we can predict how it's going to fly. We can calculate the center of the weight for the lure. Uh, we get uh, all the ideas that before that it was just a trial and error, yeah, trial and yeah. error, you know, like going through the silicon molds. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of speed up the process before you hit the water with the lure. It's already reason you have a already reasonable idea how it's gonna fly, yes, how but it's gonna work. The, the thing is that the lure was tested in the water too. Mm -hmm. So like we we get the idea. Okay, so from it's the going in parallel. You, you, yeah. you par oh, okay, yeah. okay. Like and we is are it like getting... a this special software for 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 lure development, or just like a regular? No, no, no. no. It's kind just of uh, the cut design. All oh, right, right, right. So there is no magic. It's not like. Hmm. Um, how to make your soft lure design cut? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something yeah, like this. Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. Would you would you <clears throat> would you like to plug in uh, your your website now and like how where people can go to to buy your lures? Um, yes, of course. Um, with introduction of the new lure, we'll be opening the online store. Oh. So on www.piratelures.com, you will find everything, all the information. Uh, all the rigging techniques, uh, all the presentation ideas mm -hmm. for the lure, how you should present the lure for the mm -hmm. predator, how you should retrieve the lure. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, plus online store, so you can order them. Oh, whatever that's, quantity, that's, that's, that's huge. colors, sizes, whatever you mm -hmm. want. Also, I think that they be available through our company stores, mm -hmm. which is Southside Angling mm -hmm. and Lure Geek. Okay. Or lure fishing for sea bass in UK. Okay, so it's gonna be like a selected shops. You're not gonna, you're not gonna, you you, you won't get them in a, your regular tackle shop. We are not the Savage Gear. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. still mostly one man operation. Mm -hmm. Now I have a lot of support from my friend, mm -hmm. and he's helping me a lot with designing. Yeah. But it's still it's uh, the handmade, right? It is and it's not because, you know, um, we moved from doing a master copy, basically carving a master copy, then mm -hmm. going through the silicone molds, mm -hmm. stuff like this. So it is still hand poured. Yeah. Uh, but the design is mm -hmm. uh, much more advanced than anything that you can do mm -hmm. in such a short time of one year. Yeah. By computer, mm -hmm. by just experience yeah. and manual creation of yeah. the lures, and it's it's great. It's great to hear, you know, like that that that's that's moving ahead. So uh, www.piratelures.com, exactly. That's the website, and I'm sure it's gonna be up by the time this this podcast will air. Um, okay, listen, I, I want to switch gears a little bit. The last time we ended up uh, recording, you were about to leave for your uh, cycling trip uh, yeah. to Africa and all that. <laughs> now now you're back. How it, how it went? Like walk us through the, the process, it, what happened and you know. It started all because of fishing, of course. Uh, yeah, so just just remember you were, you were about yeah, to cycle through Sahara Desert to go fishing. That was the plan. Yeah. yeah. That was the plan. This is like awesome. 
Uh, all started with the legend about the place called Takla. Mm -hmm. And from a few years back, I heard legends about the Dakla, which is um, from the legend. It was a fishing village, south south Morocco, close to the border with Mauritania. Mm -hmm. uh, it's over 2,000 kilometers from Spain. So if you are landing in uh, Tangier, mm -hmm. you have still over 2,000 kilometers to cover mm -hmm. just to get south to the Morocco. Mm -hmm. So legends about huge learfish, huge corvinas. Mm -hmm. uh, they are one of the best fighting fish you can get mm -hmm. in Europe. And they all caught from shore. Yeah, uh, that, that's the beauty of this. It's all shore-based fishing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, fishing from beaches, fish, fishing from rocks. Huge sea bass, huge spotted sea bass. Like every single person I met in Spain, uh, every single angler. They heard about this place in Morocco that it's really good for fishing. Mm -hmm. Then some were able to say not only that there is this magical place in Morocco, but they were saying, yeah, it's called Dakla. Mm -hmm. So I started doing my research and yeah, it's, yeah, this place really exists. <laughs> so, I, you know, it was the first positive thing. The second shock was it's a city, mm -hmm. 100,000 people living there. Wow. Uh, hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. Wow. One of the biggest fishing fleets uh, in Africa. Oh. One of the that biggest. That doesn't sound. That doesn't sound. Yeah, doesn't that's sound good. a bit of deal breaker. Yeah. But still, information that I was getting was really positive. Mm -hmm. The biggest concern was, of course, about the safety. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. From. Usual point of view, you know, you are going to Africa, you are going to Sahara, you have the Al Qaeda of the Maghreb, which mm -hmm. is operating somewhere there. Mm -hmm. We are just probably in Europe not aware of the distances. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, somewhere there means one and a half thousand kilometers farther. Mm -hmm. It's like being afraid to go to Helsinki mm -hmm. because you had riots in Paris. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. more or less that absurd. Yeah. So I started doing my research about the place. Mm -hmm. The initial idea was just to do a um, car trip with a few friends, pack the car and go there. You know, just this romantic idea of a mm -hmm. uh, road trip, you know, driving there. Mm -hmm. But as the time was progressing and as the date of the departure or booking tickets and everything was getting closer, mm -hmm. uh, I started to be aware that it's not going to happen. It, it always falls apart. And it always like, falls apart. It's like, yeah, 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 dude, we're Let's going, we're going. And, and the closer day is like, ah, you know, I have this stuff going on here. Yeah, yeah, my wife is not happy. I'm awaiting child. I'm busy at work. You know, usual mm. stuff of life. Lack of commitment. No, to it's... The fishing. <laughs> it's just... Maybe some people don't... Are not so extreme into <laughs> going after... That's for sure. Senses. Like, Kuvai can assure you some people are not extreme <laughs> as you. That's sure. That's for no, sure. It, uh, I don't mean it in this way. Like... I totally understand, you know. Mm. If you have a family thing mm. going. Mm. If you are busy at work. You can just say, ah, sorry, you have to wait. Baby have to wait. My wife have to, has to wait. Everything has to wait. I'm going fishing. Yeah, exactly. I'm going fishing and I'll be back in two, two weeks or two months or whatever the time. Um, luckily, I was in position that I was able to say so. And my loving wife, she's she understands my condition <laughs> <laughs> yeah we could we covered that in detail in the previous yeah. episode of the podcast how you carefully laid out all your personal life and everything to yeah, to, to be able to do what you do <laughs> she's kind of very forgiving when it comes to my psychosis you know fishing psychosis that i have from time to time so yeah, I, I decided, you know, mm. the only possible solution for me is just to cycle there. I'm unable to afford uh, driving there on my own mm -hmm. because of the petrol cost. They will just kill me. Oh, Ferry really? plus the petrol plus everything. It's mm. just too much for a single person to handle. Right. 
So what's the cheap alternative? And I was like bicycle. looking around and my bicycle. So yeah, I prepared my bicycle. Uh, it was a fat bike, so really, really wide tires. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's good for sand, right? You were expecting to cycle a lot on sand. That, that was my idea, you know, like uh, mm-hmm. I'd be going through a very rough terrain, uh, a lot of sand, a mm-hmm. lot of beach driving, uh, mm-hmm. beach cycling, stuff mm-hmm. like this. So, you know, that mm-hmm. that's pro- po- possibly the best tool you can get. Yeah. Uh, then I ordered uh, the pannier bags from a Polish company, mm-hmm. and they were perfect. Mm-hmm. Like I was really surprised by the quality. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are manufactured in Czech Republic mm-hmm. and sold through a Polish company called mm-hmm. Alpine Bike, and they are really surprisingly good. Mm-hmm. So the thing that I kind of skipped in the picture was that you, of course, you can get all the stuff that you need. But because you are not traveling by motorized means, mm-hmm. like all the way that you are covering is just by your muscle, mm-hmm. uh, you should probably start reducing your weight because mm-hmm. every single gram has to be carried mm-hmm. out by your own mm-hmm. muscles. Mm-hmm. So probably carrying ar- around 12 kilos of just fishing equipment <laughs> was not such a great idea. Mm-hmm. I ended up with the bike which weighed at around 55, maybe 57 Whoa. kilos with all the tackle on it. Whoa. Because the fat bike itself is not light. No, the bike itself was probably around 20 kilos maximum. It's with, not light, man. <laughs> with all the bags, panniers. And, yeah. But, you know, I'm kind of a chunky person. So mm-hmm. for me, the difference between 16 and 20 kilos, it's not mm-hmm. not much of the difference. Yeah. Yeah. If you weigh, if you're, you know, your own starting weight is over 100 kilos. Mm-hmm. Four or five kilos here and there doesn't mm-hmm. make any real difference. Is it? Or, or it makes huge difference because you're... No, I don't think so. All right. I think it's just proportion of your body, you know. Yeah, if you perhaps. are very slim, let's say 60, 70 kilos, mm-hmm. five or 10 kilos for you is mm-hmm. substantial amount of your own body weight. If you're mm-hmm. 110, five kilos is just... Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, like getting your haircut. haircut. Yeah. Something Mm -hmm. like this. So as I said, like over 55 kilos on a bike. Mm -hmm. Uh, White tires, a lot of drag on the tires. Mm -hmm. uh, Low gearing because Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fat bike. So it's not the speed demon that you can imagine. (laughs) And you you know this saying like, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Yeah. That's exactly how my trip went. <laughs> it's, you know, it should be. But you've done your research. Motto. You've done all the all the yeah. all the right things. Surprisingly, not enough. Wow. So the route that I planned it was on the road N1. It's the national road that goes from the Tangier up to Dakla. Mm-hmm. One road on the coast. Mm-hmm. Simple. Simple. Hard to get lost <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. In there. The problem was uh, the amount of traffic. Yeah. The thing that I did not didn't anticipate mm-hmm. was the amount of traffic. Mm-hmm. Basically, all the time you are being passed by trucks, cars, buses, uh, stuff like this. Permanent traffic. Yeah, it's just deafening. Yeah, you know the roar of the engines, the amount of the diesel fumes that you are breathing. Yeah. It's just after a day of cycling, you are not only tired, but your head, it feels like, you know, like someone put you're, you into the metal and... Can, yeah. can and just shake it for a few yeah. hours. Yeah, it's, it's true. Like, like our, our friend, friend of the podcast, Thomas McIntyre, he's like right now, as we speak, cycling down the length of Africa. And uh, he was saying that, like, you know, he's trying to pick up like a side road as much as possible precisely to avoid traffic yep. like like exactly that you said that this is a big issue and the other problem with the road is a coastal road so it's never flat all the time you are going mm-hmm. uphill or downhill yeah uh picking a secondary i road. think that can be i think that for some that can be actually the advantage if they're into cycling more than into like because uh, let's get clear you were for you it was a commute right that was you very you, much you yeah. want to get to the point rather than enjoy the process of cycling oh no 
it's it was supposed to be you know, the major adventure for me. Mm-hmm. But the thing was yeah. that if your bike is so heavy, yeah, every single hill will just basically like a, like a 60 kilo fat bike is not yeah. exactly a climbing bike it's not what not you would exactly. not, <laughs> no. not what you would call climbing bike so when i landed in morocco mm-hmm. uh, the first thing i was going from the algeciras mm-hmm. uh, where i had where i spent the summer mm-hmm. just let's start with this um i spent the summer in algeciras Mm-hmm. Because I wanted to get used to the climate. Yeah, you know, if you are coming from islands like this year, mm. we had marvelous summer, mm-hmm. but it's not very typical. Yeah. So if your medium temperature is around ten degrees, fifteen degrees maximum in mm-hmm. the summer, and you are landing somewhere when it's thirty-eight and forty degrees, mm-hmm. uh, just a difference in the temperature will just make yeah. it very very hard for you. Then yeah. add to this. Uh, enormous physical strain Mm -hmm. like cycling on a heavy loaded bike Mm -hmm. 80 kilometers every day Mm -hmm. it's just getting to the point when it's dangerous yeah so you're so exhausted that you're not paying attention to all the stuff but it's also kind of destroying for your body you know your body Mm -hmm. is not used to these temperatures Mm -hmm. not used to the amount of uh, physical strain that you are putting on it Mm -hmm. Uh, it's unable to regulate the temperature, mm-hmm. uh, so the, your chances of getting a heat stroke or something like this are really high. That's mm-hmm. why I decided to move to Algeciras a bit earlier, mm-hmm. two months before my trip, mm. just to kind of get used to hot get used to the hot weather. weather and cycling in hot weather. Yeah, and it was really really tough at the start. You know, cycling when it's 35 outside. Yep. That's a completely different deal than cycling in Ireland. Mm -hmm. There is no way of cooling yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. The amount of water that you require for such cycling is just enormous. Yeah. A few liters every day just Mm -hmm. to cover the loss. Yeah. uh, That goes through you all the time. Yeah. So... That, that's why I got to the ferry from Algeciras. Mm-hmm. And to my surprise, the ferry landed in Tangier. But I didn't knew this before. I didn't know this before. There are two Tangiers. One is Tangierville, which is a major city. <laughs> and one is Tangier Met. You ended up in the wrong Tangier. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so let's wind back for a second. So so you moved to Al- Algeciras? Is that the name? Yeah, just to... Just for two two months. Yeah, just... And you just acclimatize, you just get used to the temperature, all yep. that, all that. And then you said, okay, now I'm going to pull the trigger. You packed your bike, you get on the per- on the ferry, you get to Tangier. Um, ended up being... E- even my start, you know, like, I finally managed to pack my bike. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was... Li- li- I was living in the apartment on the eighth floor of the building, mm-hmm. so I had to get a lift down. Mm-hmm. So I got my bike outside with all the pannier bags and mm-hmm. everything. I started closing the door and the kick leg on the bike broke and all the bike with all the equipment fall down like uh, oh. through the stairs, one floor down. <laughs> and oh, I was Jesus. like, oh, that's a good start of the trip. Luckily, the bike was okay, mm-hmm. nothing damaged. Mm-hmm. Uh, except of my dignity, <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> so I packed myself on the ferry. How do you how do you pack your rod? Do you, do you have like a like a fishing rod? Do you have like a, a, a multi part travel rod yeah. that was small? Yeah. Or like I went f- with uh, four piece rods. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, nine foot long. I was just long. I'm just I just remember vaguely when you know from my first uh, steps in Ireland when I was obviously also cycling to the fishing spot and I had this you know enormous. Uh, beach caster two-piece beach caster mm. rod and i was kind of cycling with that it was like either it was like a sticking out of my back like a like a like an antenna and i was like careful to not <laughs> you should go medieval you know the, like yeah, hold it in your yeah, head yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so then the next thing was kind of to strap it into, into the top tube on the, on the on the bike so that's what's my question like you had like a proper travel yeah proper rod. travel rod that were strapped to one of the back panniers okay and okay. out of the way as you were getting mm-hmm. on the bike or out yeah. of the bike so somebody seeing you cycling wouldn't say like oh this guy is cycling to go fishing <laughs> no but not sticking out though they were <clears throat> people i met in morocco they always thought that you know i have some kind of engine hidden 
hidden <laughs> in one of the panniers. Yeah. And because of the rods, they were stretching out. They follow its yeah. exhaust pipe. <laughs> or something <laughs> like this. They were always really surprised to find that oh, it's okay. fishing rods and there is no motor in the uh, bank. Okay, 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 okay. So I landed in Tangier and I looked at the GPS and I was like, uh, oh. guys, <laughs> did I get to the wrong ferry or what's the story? Mm -hmm. Because the Tangierville where I was supposed to start Mm -hmm. was 50 kilometers from there. 50. 50 kilometers wow. through the mountains mm -hmm. on a very narrow road with extreme traffic. Mm -hmm. Wow. So... Just uh, sounds like perfect start. <laughs> perfect start, yeah. And they packed me to the bus. Uh, from the ferry, they packed me to the bus. We went to the passenger terminal mm -hmm. where the customs said I'm unable to pass through because they have to scan my bags mm -hmm. and uh, my bike. It mm -hmm. all have to go through the X-ray, mm -hmm. and my bike is too big to fit through the scanners. <laughs> so I have to go back uh, through the car exit. Okay. Not the passenger exit, but through the car exit. The car so exit. Okay. It was at least an hour, just because this port it's huge. Mm -hmm. It's newly built by Morocco. They mm -hmm. needed uh, deep water access uh, mm -hmm. from the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. So they created maybe 10, maybe 15 years ago, a new port, huge one, really wow. ready to yeah, any big, ship that big ships come and stuff, in. Yeah. So it took me probably an hour just to get to the car exit. Mm -hmm. Then all the procedure, uh, you know, like I was passing through, waving my passport because they are stamping your passport on the ferry. Mm -hmm. And the customs, they were like, oh yeah, yeah, go, go, go. Mm -hmm. Because I was so late, all the cars went through, so mm -hmm. I was the only one going through the border. Okay. And then as I was just passing through, I heard like, ah, stop, you sir, stop, stop now. <laughs> so I kind of panicked, what's the story? And one of the customs, he came out of his uh, office and he said, I've never seen a bike like this. I need a selfie with your bike. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we started the story, you know. Mm, uh, mm, okay. Exactly about the trip, and they were like, "Are you aware how far Dakla is from here?" Mm -hmm. They said, "You know, it's a different, different end of our country, and it's a really long country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's probably the size of Norway, something like this." Yeah. So, yeah, and I said, "Yeah, of course, mm -hmm. um, I know where I'm going." Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they looks in their eyes, they were kind of like, we are <laughs> not really sure <laughs> that you really do. <laughs> so I started cycling towards the Tanger, mm -hmm. but after 15 kilometers, I was completely flat. The mm -hmm. amount of traffic that goes between those uh, two Tangiers, mm -hmm. uh, constant heavy traffic, uh, cargo going from the ferries. Yeah. Uh, plus the roadworks that they are having, so huge trucks, mm -hmm. heavy loaded trucks. Yeah. I was lucky enough uh, on the petrol station that I was passing through, mm -hmm. there was a Toyota Hilux pickup with empty beds on the back and two guys just sitting and chilling. And I said like, okay, now or never. Mm -hmm. I came to them and, do you speak English? Yes, we do. Which wasn't very usual uh -huh. uh, through my trip. And I explained my situation, you know, I'm kind of mixed up. I landed in wrong, wrong Tangier and mm -hmm. road is just dangerous and very mm -hmm. tiring. Any chance that you are going to Tangier and can give me a lift? And I said like, yeah, sure. Drop your bike to the bed of the truck and let's go. Oh, <laughs> we cool. are just about to leave to Tangier. So I got hitchhiked with, with my bike. Awesome. For the most difficult part, mm -hmm. and I was really surprised, you know, how those drivers are operating there. Mm -hmm. The road is really narrow, like mm -hmm. the country country roads in Ireland, mm -hmm. really steep. Mm -hmm. The amount of traffic, it's just insane. Mm. Old cars, new cars, trucks, buses, uh, guys riding on the donkeys, guys <laughs> uh, like dogs running across the road, children on the sides of the road. It, it it's just such a chaos yeah so they got me to the tangier and mm -hmm. tangier is just breathtaking mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful cities i've ever seen the proper tangier proper tangier <coughs> really highly recommended go to mm -hmm. tangier for holidays mm -hmm. so i passed through the tangier i started cycling mm -hmm. and my plan was to go to the place which is called asilla mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's a small city, small town, mm-hmm. past the Tangier, like first major town, maybe 50 kilometers from mm-hmm. Tangier. But because I got all the delay from the port and then mm-hmm. I was in the wrong place mm-hmm. and stuff like this, I knew that I won't be able to make it. And mm-hmm. it was, it started to get dark. Mm-hmm. I landed on the beach. Mm-hmm. I just decided that you know it's really getting dark did you had a did you had a tent with you yes yes, you, yes. You I, I was pre i was prepared to be you know self self-supported self-supported completely mm-hmm. so i had tent i had water all my cooking stuff okay, that, that's okay. why the bike was so Proper. goddamn heavy yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so i landed on the beach mm-hmm. and there was a fishing hut mm-hmm. Ta-da. Bo- boats and everything and you know, it was my first day in Morocco, first mm-hmm. day in Africa. I was really concerned about safety, mm-hmm. how it's going to be, if I'm safe, if mm-hmm. someone will come at the night and try to hurt me or steal my bike. Mm-hmm. Basically, you know, pure ignorance of mm-hmm. white people from Europe. Mm-hmm. So I got to the guys and started chatting with them, mm-hmm. trying to explain myself, first in English, mm-hmm. no luck. Then in Spanish, my basic Spanish mm-hmm. was not much better. Mm-hmm because guys were speaking only Arabic mm-hmm. and th- th- there is this beautiful invention which is called Google Translate you can type whatever you want to mm-hmm. your phone and then it's mm-hmm. even speaking in the mm-hmm. language so mm-hmm. that's what really saved me a lot during this trip right. and did I you had a did you had like a car that was uh, you were you were in, in, in the role you were roaming on your phone or no, you, were, you no. had a, like a local on, on the border crossing there are guys you just uh, got the local card on the border crossing just behind the customs mm-hmm. next building is guys uh, that are selling sim cards oh, okay. so for i think 20 euros mm-hmm. equivalent of 20 euros you mm-hmm. get unlimited uh, broadband yeah. very fast that's handy that's really surprising where wherever i was in morocco mm-hmm. there was always 4g high-speed broadband better than the rural ireland huh oh that's <laughs> that's a lot a lot of difference but honestly you are in the middle of the desert mm-hmm. uh 30 kilometers from the closest town mm-hmm. um, not a single structure built by man mm-hmm. within your eyesight mm-hmm. except of the road that you are standing on mm-hmm. and you can still watch movies on netflix <laughs> with high <laughs> definition <laughs> that's really impressive that's awesome so i stopped on the beach i started chatting with the guys through the translator Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were getting kind of stiff and i thought like what's the story you know they are just fishermen Mm -hmm. so they started chatting talking within themselves and they asked for some someone in the building in Mm -hmm. their hut Mm -hmm. And there comes the guy in the uniform. Mm-hmm. Apparently, they are not fishermen. It's a uh, border patrol by Royal Moroccan Marines. <laughs> you took them for fishermen. <laughs> yeah, and they are guiding the beach for... They, they are watching their border and guarding the beach because of the Spaniards. So here I am speaking Spanish. <laughs> kind of, They're guarding border good. just precisely from the types of like you. <laughs> exactly. And it was, you know, you can see from their faces that that's the worst, worst nightmare coming through. Spaniards came <laughs> on their beach. That's what they were <laughs> on the bike. For, they're for they're invading us on the bikes. Exactly. And I, I was just trying to explain, you know, guys, mm-hmm. if it's possible, if I just place my tent next to your mm-hmm. uh, stuff, because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously mm-hmm. it's going to be a protected area. Mm-hmm. They said it's not possible, but they contacted their boss, mm-hmm. main boss mm-hmm. from the town because he speaks Spanish. Mm-hmm. I started speaking Spanish with him and maybe after two sentences, he's like, uh, your Spanish is really poor. Like, where are you from? <laughs> and because obviously you're not Spanish. And I told him I'm from Poland. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest surprise of the trip. Uh, if you say to someone in Morocco that you are from Poland, they are like, whoa, that's great. We love Poland. And I was like, what's, well, what's the story? Surprisingly, Poland is really well known in Morocco. Oh, mostly through the due to the Robert Lewandowski. Oh, okay. The footballer. Yeah. They are all like, ah, oh, Robert Lewandowski. Yeah, you are from <laughs> Poland. That's great. Okay. 
So once they heard that I'm from Poland, they said like, no problem, you can leave your tent next to our uh, hut. Mm. Just uh, if we may ask, be gone by the morning because we may run into trouble. You know, if there is any inspection or something yeah, like yeah, this, yeah, sure. it won't be good for us. So th- that was, you know, big adventure first day. Mm. Then on the that's s- just first day. That's just the first night. Yeah. Then on the second day, I had to cover a road to the place called La Racha. Mm-hmm. But because from the first day I lost so much time, mm-hmm. it added around 20 kilometers to my road. Mm-hmm. So instead of covering maybe 60 kilometers, I had to cover around 85, mm-hmm. 85 kilometers with very, very steep hills uh, between. So it was really one of the most effort I had in all mm-hmm. the trip just climbing those hills and you know it's just a start of your trip you are soft you are not used to mm-hmm. this amount of effort you are not used to the heaviness of your bike mm-hmm. so I went through Asila which is beautiful town highly recommended small town but beautiful mm. and people there are so friendly <laughs> that's one of the things that you I've noticed in Morocco, like uh, people were warning me that uh, Moroccans, they be very aggressive, trying to sell me something. Mm -hmm. They will beg for money. They will demand money from me. Nothing like this happened through all the trip. I was really surprised how friendly those people are and how safe it is in Morocco. Mm. Major concern, which was safety. Turned out not to be concerned at all. Not at all. That's one of the safest places I know. It's much safer than Spain. Mm. It's much safer than Tala in Dublin or mm. places like this. You can walk there in the evening. No one will bother you. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I you know, kind of can relate to that. Uh, it was like a 10, 8 or 10 years ago when I was in, in, in Guinea-Bissau, mm. when at the time I was... Your also, famous oh, trip. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah that was... And I was also like, oh, Jesus, man, this country is destabilizing, poorest country, like whatever. And and I was talking to the, the, the guy who was organizing those trips there, and he said like, well, look, it's safer than in Manchester, man. So yeah. like... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> get, the, get the proper... You know. Exactly. Like the idea that uh, you'll be welcomed by a bunch of uh, Talibs, Al Qaeda, ISIS waving machetes, machetes, mm. and waiting just to execute you. It's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just absurd. Mm-hmm. And uh, through all the trip, all the people I met were friendly, uh, very, very helpful. Mm-hmm. Like honestly, every single person I met was friendly. It's great. So it's very positive thing about Morocco. Hmm. But the Asila, some somehow GPS it ran me through the marketplace, mm-hmm. the major market street, mm-hmm. and it was not something that I was expecting to be thrown mm-hmm. thrown on. Mm-hmm. You know, my second day in Africa, mm-hmm. uh, market street is just quite narrow mm-hmm. with tons of. sellers mm-hmm. they, they are selling everything uh, fruits vegetables uh, eggs meat fish mm-hmm. all this stuff is in huge heat the mm-hmm. water is melting from the fish and the ice that they are on mm-hmm. the blood is dripping from the butcher stands mm-hmm. and parts of the meat mm-hmm. then the eggs are being thrown on the ground the rotting fruit and vegetables it's all mixed by the Hundreds of people that are passing through, yeah, donkeys that are passing through, uh, mopeds that are passing through. Uh, Jeez. it all the ground, it was just covered by some kind of slime, maybe mm-hmm. two centimeters thick. Mm-hmm. It was like walking on the ice. Oh, god, and the smell of that place, it's just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. It's nothing that you can describe by the words. Mm-hmm. And the huge contrast was some of those uh, sellers, they were extremely poor. Mm-hmm. Some of the buyers, they were extremely poor. You can see that, mm-hmm. you know, basically all they have is packed on the donkey that they are mm-hmm. pushing through. Yeah. And then you hear this beep, beep, beep. And there is this posh range over just like 
brand new car. That, that's a, that's the thing, right? In those poor countries that <clears throat> the contrast. Those, yeah, the, the, it's the just shocking. Yeah, the, the the gap between poor and rich is is so high in the poorest countries, yeah. and this is like a distribution. It's not kind of even and even out. The, so the no. amount of wealth is like a concentrated in, in specific places. But and then the all contrast, the rest is like, you know, of the place. Uh, of the smell of the place, uh, extreme poverty that you see through Morocco, mm -hmm. and extra posh cars that you won't be able to see even in Ireland very mm -hmm. often. Yeah, it's, and it's like again the same same story in Bissau. So you have those cars like complete ruin without doors and like yeah. with the you know no windows, all that, and then like like you said, like a new BMWs and like Maseratis, a, stuff yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah, you know, yeah. like stuff that you are not expecting to see in, in, in Africa. Europe. No, even in Europe. Yeah, such concentration like in a big town in mm -hmm. or city mm -hmm. uh, in Morocco. Yeah. So I passed through. Luckily, without any sepsa, sepsis and <laughs> stuff mm. like this, it was really tough going because, you know, my bike was really big, really mm -hmm. wide. I tried to push through yeah. all the people. Mm -hmm. Still fresh in Morocco, so kind of paranoid mm -hmm. if someone will try to take one of the bags from my panniers mm -hmm. or my yeah. passport or my camera. Oh, so yeah, yeah. all these paranoias that you have. And I pushed through. And after a few hours of cycling, I was getting close to the La Racha. It was the end of the trip for me. So I was kind of getting relaxed. You know, it was all mm -hmm. looking great. I started, uh, it was the la last climb, mm -hmm. or last climb, climb of climb, the day. Yeah. And then suddenly the track that was going from the opposite direction, there was another track behind it and mm -hmm. he started to overtake. Yeah, the previous sense. one so it's a narrow road and you are faced with two trucks just speeding straight into you so you know it was the chance of either get off the way or be smashed by a truck mm -hmm. because the road is so narrow mm -hmm. so the only thing that was left for me is to go to to the ditch yeah luckily i was just going uphill so there wasn't much of momentum and speed mm -hmm. so i went off the road and falling from the bike i managed to stab myself with um you know the gear ring in front of yeah. your bike yeah yeah the chain ring chain ring yeah so i managed to spike my feet with the chain ring and ah. completely cut my um, ah. my feet with it wow and all the hill completely destroyed. You know, it was very, very deep cut with the chain yeah. ring and everything. And I was like, yeah. oh, God damn it. Not, not looking good. Yeah. But you see, I poured some water uh, that I had mm -hmm. on it. Uh, bleeding because it was quite hot. Bleeding mm -hmm. stopped mm -hmm. quite fast. Mm -hmm. I decided, you know, there is no point on staying here. Like, what can I do? I have to continue cycling at least to La Racha, you know. Yes. Yeah. bigger town, so... Yeah. If I need any help, I'll be able to get some. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, my bike, it survived the second fall. Mm -hmm. First on the stairs, <laughs> now to the <laughs> ditch. It was, you know, fat bikes are really good <laughs> when it comes to But fall. this is like a like a huge thing. Like on, on those trips, that's why you want to steal bikes. That's what yeah. you want everything. Like Answer. a, like a yeah, yeah, like not, no, no, not like a finicky carbon fiber no, or anything no no, no. you want to, no you want to steal and all that because you might end up in a ditch or like whatever else yeah and i started cycling to la racha and you know a lot of pain mm -hmm. but mostly stress you mm -hmm. know you are i got almost killed by a truck mm -hmm. so a lot of stress and everything and mm -hmm. i'm entering the la racha and there is this guy on the moped he just passed me and then maybe 150 meters in front of me, he's smashed by a car. Oh. And, you know, it's like time freezes. Mm -hmm. And you see his uh, moped just dismantling into hundreds of pieces. And this guy is flying in the air. Jeez. Kind of not knowing you can see this. Mm -hmm. You know, not knowing what's going to happen. Then he's hitting the ground, breaking his legs, both of them. You see this. You hear the Bones. basically like crunch of the breaking bones. Oh. And this guy just sliding uh, up to the side of the road and hitting the side of the road at the end with his helmet. He 
was really lucky to have his helmet. Otherwise, it's going to oh, be okay. a fatal one. And it's like, you know, second close call mm -hmm. in maybe 40 minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, I decided. Did you mention that the place is safe, safest that you would know? It is very safe, but. Uh, it doesn't sound like safe because in 40 minutes. When it comes to driving, uh, they are kind of. Yeah, I know. Crazy. I'm just kidding. I know what you mean. It's safe in terms of like a social kind of setting. Yes. Safe, mm, not safe definitely when you go not driving. on the road or driving no. or cycling or anything like that. So I decided that that's enough for me. I stopped the first policeman that I, mm -hmm. luckily for the guy that was smashed by the car, mm -hmm. uh, police was just on the other side of the street. The mm -hmm. amount of police in Morocco is really surprising. Mm -hmm. They are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Every major uh, road cross, mm -hmm. every major point in town, mm -hmm. you will find them, at least few of them standing there and mm -hmm. just watching yeah. what's happening. So the guy was very fastly taken care of mm -hmm. by police. Mm -hmm. They they were obviously trained in you know yeah. fir first response, first aid, yeah. and stuff. They like saw this. they saw the guy smashed by the car like yeah. every day. It, it was just week. in front of them, maybe five meters from mm -hmm. them, because they were just on the other side yeah. of the street. Yeah. So, but then you know, based on what you're saying, it's not like an uncommon occurring. No. Mm. So I stopped the other policeman. I asked him, you know, what's the closest hotel that I can get that's not very expensive. Mm -hmm. He showed me the place. Mm, it took me some time to find it properly. And I was so tired, so stressed. Uh, you know, it was like too much happened that mm -hmm. day for me. Yep. And the hotel was on the first floor. <laughs> so I had my 55 kilos bike, very steep stairs. Mm -hmm the hotel and uh, the guy in the hotel he was like friendly but obviously trying to rip me off so mm -hmm. firstly he asked for 50 euros for a night and mm -hmm. I said like come on man you know mm -hmm. I know what her what the prices are in Morocco you know what the prices are in Morocco don't be silly so <laughs> it took us maybe 10 minutes of you know good haggling just mm -hmm. to get uh, the price down mm -hmm. so I ended up paying 14 euros for a night which is twice as much as locals pay mm -hmm. but i had a room all for myself yeah and he even helped me with some of the bugs upstairs so it was really good no. and i started watching my feet and it was really like you know the skin was torn apart mm -hmm. and i decided that there is no point in going to the hospital like what hospital can do for me yeah um, yeah, Give probably me. the same thing that you can do for you yeah. with the first aid kit. And I had a bag of um, a bottle of super glue. Mm -hmm. So basically, I opened the wound, I poured the super glue inside, closed the wound, poured some more super glue on it. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, super glue <laughs> was made for <laughs> closing yeah. the wounds. Yeah, yeah. It's a military stuff yeah. and it works really miracles. Mm. But I started thinking, you know, if following this road, uh, from La Rache, the next steps were getting close to the Rabat, which is the capital of Morocco, mm -hmm. then Casablanca. Mm -hmm. So I decided to hitch a train mm -hmm. and cover the road to Casablanca by train. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, it was impossible because I ended up with the end of holidays in Morocco. Mm -hmm. So all the trains were completely full. I had to take a bus. By bus, I got to Casablanca. Mm -hmm. And then from Casablanca, I started cycling forward south. Wow. A few days later, I reached my friend. Uh, he's uh, an angler. So hang on, hang on, hang on a second, because you're, you're, you're like, you covered in great detail two days. Yeah. So at the end of day three, was it? You're in Casablanca. Day four, yeah. Day I'm four. In Casablanca. Okay. And then you're like, another couple of days is just like uneventful cycling through the desert or how does no, that went? no that, that, that's the other thing there, there is no desert there mm. there is no desert there is no wildlife it's highly urbanized highly civilized area you are cycling mm. on the tarmac on a normal road okay you on um, me on the fat bike was just absurd it it was like riding a tractor you know on m15 dublin <laughs> 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 this this level of absurd right there's no point on bringing a mountain bike even mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. any gravel bike even road bike mm -hmm. is much more suitable for such a trip mm -hmm. than a fat bike mm -hmm. yeah so 
it was like this thing that was kind of like, oh, this guy is like totally out of place here. Not only yeah. slightly out of place, he's like a totally out of place. Yeah. Completely. And I met tons of really nice people, mm -hmm. people with very strange histories, mm -hmm. uh, old campsite, probably built even by French mm -hmm. because it was really old, mm -hmm. run by a Moroccan guy. Mm -hmm who was sitting there with his uh, small yellow chickens <laughs> that were his closest family <laughs> and surprisingly drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> of course, like what, what else would you do? <laughs> uh, it's a Muslim country, so that's oh, the yeah. only person I met uh, drinking alcohol. Mm. And he's like, oh, I don't care anymore. Mm. So I managed to land at my friend's house. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in El Qualidia. Mm -hmm. So you're like n right now, like in like week in, week in into my mm -hmm. trip around mm -hmm. 600 kilometers from Tangier. Mm -hmm. I'm landing in my friend's. His name is Karim. Mm -hmm. uh, in, I'm landing at his house, and you know I'm trying to explain my trip farther to mm -hmm. Dakla. He was fishing in Dakla before once uh, okay. with his cousin or mm -hmm. uh, brother. And I see that he's getting really concerned. Mm -hmm. And he asked his father. Uh, his father, that's an epic fig figure, mm -hmm. honestly. Like, the man is so strong. Mm -hmm. uh, he's 72 or 74 at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, fishing almost every day. Great fisherman. Mm -hmm. Catching tons of bass. The mm -hmm. bass that they are getting there. 12 kilos, 14 kilos. Was it striper bass or what? Are no, the... that's just the sea bass, the same that we have Oh, here. just the same sea bass yeah. as we have European sea bass. Yeah, in mm. Morocco they grow much larger. Right. And I started... Warmer waters, more food. I think so, yeah. And I started chatting with his father through Karim, he was doing mm -hmm. translation, then with his brother, then with his friend, and they were all like, man, it's not going to work. You know, like the road is impossible. And I told them well, it's not possible because I knew about so many people that are cycling to mm -hmm. e even much farther than Dakla. Yeah. And they said, yes, of course, but not at this season. Oh. Apparently, September is the hottest month uh, in Morocco uh, with average temperatures well over 40 degrees. Wow. It's not August, it's not July, it's September. Mm -hmm. Then what they said, uh, September is the time that snakes are getting really active. Mm -hmm. So they have this uh, puffer snake or mm -hmm. puffer adder, that's how it's called, okay. which know. is very venomous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, not a neurotoxin, mm -hmm. but it's just a toxin that destroys your muscles completely. Right. And they said every single year around September, people are being beaten. If you are beaten somewhere around the head, you are dead. They mm -hmm. said, like, no one will be able to deliver you to hospital fast enough mm -hmm. to save you. Especially uh, yourself on the bike won't be able to they, they said that even, you know, because um, mm. the area is highly populated. Okay. Tons of cars. So it's not like you are middle of nowhere mm -hmm. all by your own. Mm -hmm. Still. Still, it's very, very dangerous. And mm. they said, once you get to the Agadir, which was probably around the next 400 kilometers from Al Qualidia. Mm -hmm. They said the snake problem is no longer a problem. Mm -hmm. But they said uh, from Agadir or farther, you will get the packs of wild dogs. Mm -hmm. The dogs that were brought there by Bedouin mm -hmm. for. Like a feral dog. Feral dogs. Completely wild, feral. Mm -hmm. And they said basically they are kind of like a wolves hunting mm -hmm. there. Right. And they said, uh, you see, the problem in summer is uh, during the winter time, it's safe because they hunt through the day and through the day, dogs won't attack you. They are too scared, too afraid, mm -hmm. even if there is pack of them. Mm -hmm. And because it's cold at night, they are sleeping through the night. Mm -hmm. During the September, it's so hot through the day that they are sleeping through the day. And hunting through the night. Hunting through the night when they are kind of getting extra points for mm -hmm. <laughs> being aggressive and everything. Yeah. And they said... And you're sleeping at night, and that's where the and danger they said, comes from. Yeah, and they said, you know, it's deadly dangerous. Every single year, people are being just mauled to death mm. by dogs. By dogs. I heard, I heard that the in India that the feral dogs are a big problem in India as well. 
Yeah. So the problem with dogs, um, I have friends from Libya. He used to live in Libya. His mother worked in the hospital. He was mm-hmm. a nurse. She was a nurse in a hospital. Mm-hmm. And he confirmed the same thing. He says, like, every single summer we got dozens of people mauled by dogs. Hmm. And he said, it's really dangerous. It's not like they're going to bite you once. They will try to kill you. Yeah. And yeah, that, that, food. that's what they said. You know, if your total weight is lighter than the pack of dogs, and they said it's 10 of them, 15 of them, 20 of them, mm-hmm. uh, you are just being considered as food mm-hmm. because they are just hunting them. And they said, you know, even though your road is quite well planned, you want to cover only 70 kilometers from day by day, mm-hmm. and you have the checkpoints planned, mm-hmm. uh, fishing villages, uh, mm-hmm. petrol stations, places like this mm-hmm. that, you know, there are people and dogs won't be uh, such an issue. They said, still, what's going to happen if you fall from bike? What's going to happen if you get a flat tire? You will lose maybe an hour maybe two hours maybe three hours yeah something happens you're getting into the night you are getting into the night and you are forced to sleep outside alone mm-hmm. you cannot sleep by the road because it's too dangerous so you have to move maybe 200 300 meters from the road mm-hmm. and then you are just an easy prey for those dogs and they will find you because they oh yeah will. they have a smell they have a smell and you, you have and your and your and your stinky rock and roll animal exactly <laughs> exactly so they said you know it's just basically they said like of course there is a chance that you will be able to make it through that mm-hmm. to Dakla without any problem mm-hmm. but they said if you run into the problem mm-hmm. it won't be like you know dodging a truck on the road and hitting a ditch mm-hmm. they said if you survive so such problems you'll be really really lucky and probably really destroyed by those dogs mm-hmm. yep so my idea was, you know, if you are chatting with three guys which are fishermen, one of them is ex-military, mm-hmm. and they are all saying to you, like, no. They probably know what they're saying. Not, not the best idea, you know, it's close to suicide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I decided that there is no point on pushing forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I had to change my plans. Mm-hmm. Because you know the Dakla was the ultimate goal. Just to so, go how to many Dakla. kilometers you covered to that point? Between five and six hundred. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, with part being taken by bus, so you know probably. Oh yeah, but wheels. I mean, like that only adds adds the you know kudos points to the, to the <laughs> whole story. <laughs> so uh, I stayed there for a whole day. Mm-hmm. We went uh, fishing for a while mm-hmm. with Karim. Mm-hmm. Just basically, I was so tired after a few days without yeah. any stop. That's the other thing that I yeah. didn't took into consideration, that after every three, four, maximum five days. You should have a day rest. Day, or day of rest, maybe two, even two days if it was five days of cycling. Mm. And there I was, seven days of cycling, totally wasted. And mm. weeks, so weak that... I was not even much interested in fishing, which is not a normal thing wow, for me. Wow, that's really, yeah, but you were really in a bad shape. Then. Yeah. <laughs> and Karim took me, he was showing me places. He invited some friends and mm-hmm. his brother. And we. I spent really good days uh, mm-hmm. with his family. And the following day, he said, like, if I want to go back, he said, like, you can push to Safi, you can push to Agadir. Mm-hmm. Uh, those snakes, if you are aware of them, mm-hmm. he said, like, those snakes won't be such a problem. But for me, a shocking thing was on my last day, as I was reaching his village mm-hmm. or his town that he's living in, mm-hmm. uh, the amount of s- dead snakes uh, roadkill on the road yeah. was really surprising. Like, uh, yeah. I think I met eight or 15 of them did you give give you idea how how yeah how many and, and of them he are said like area? no those snakes are not dangerous they are just calls called uh, mouse snakes they are just feeding on mouse mm-hmm. but he said maybe 50 kilometers farther mm-hmm. uh, you get to the rocky area mm-hmm. from the farmlands you are mm-hmm. reaching the rocky areas and he said that's the dangerous snakes they, they are living through these rocks and mm-hmm. he said even one year before a policeman, a local policeman who's mm-hmm. well known to the dangers of the area, was yeah. killed by a snake. Wow. He was, uh, it was really hot day. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. and he wanted to get uh, through the shadow under mm-hmm. the tree and right. the snake was just waiting on the branch of the tree mm-hmm. and he got so close he didn't see the snake right. snake bite him into his neck they were unable to give him help before he was dead wow so he says like you know you can go as far as agadir it's quite safe mm-hmm. except of the deadly snakes of course mm-hmm. and scorpions but uh, he said from from there on it's gonna be really hard to come back and help you with coming back mm-hmm. if you want to go come back to europe leave your bike and continue hitchhiking mm-hmm. or something like this yeah so i decided that it's not worth risking yeah uh, next day, his uncle was going back to El Jadida, mm-hmm. which is kind of first stop on the way back. Mm-hmm. So they parked my bike on his huge truck, mm-hmm. one of those Morgan trucks, mm-hmm. and he gave me a lift on his truck. Mm-hmm. Great experience, you know. Right uh, now, you now you could experience all that from the from the cubby of the truck. Yeah, and he was <laughs> sitting in the cab, and you know he was really proud of his truck. You, you, you see that it's you know a man riding a beast mm-hmm. he's mm-hmm. like that's my truck mm-hmm. i'm here yeah. it's you know all the ethos of truck drivers mm-hmm. it was just like archetype yeah person yeah <laughs> and you know with his long mustache like uh-huh. uh, proper truck driver mustache <laughs> and the guy was great really great mm-hmm. and he drove me back to El jadida from mm-hmm. El jadida i managed to get a bus to mm-hmm. casablanca and from casablanca to tangier uh-huh. So it was really surprising because you know how all, how long it took you to go go back compared that's to that's the best thing you know week of cycling and going back took me probably nine hours oh nine hours okay <laughs> <laughs> i thought oh you're gonna say like a two days no like... no no i started early in the morning but uh in the uh, late evening mm-hmm. i was uh in the apartment in spain right in above you know sitting and oh <laughs> yeah soaking well was it uh was it like a relief or or was it like what's what was going through your mind were you, were you disappointed by the outcome or were no. you like happy that you completely gone... not because uh you see for me it was like uh continuing pushing forward would be just insane bravery mm-hmm. like um uh, I'm too old for this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it would be like you said, it would be borderline suicidal. Yeah. Mm. And it is possible. Mm. It is doable. Uh, but they said not alone, mm-hmm. not unprepared, not at mm. this time of the year. Right. Are you re- are you allowed to have a firearm? To be honest, I... You don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. And but because I never had one, so yeah, it, it never crossed my mind. Yeah, I mean, like you know, from the self defense of the this, these, I'm thinking about those dogs. I don't think that it will give you a lot, you know, if you are sleeping in a tent and then suddenly you are attacked by dozen of them. Oh, yeah, but I mean, like, the, before the, you are the, able the, to the find no, your the, fire, the, no, the, no, the noise itself, yeah, maybe would, would probably do o- honestly. Uh, you you you'd rather not try it. <laughs> yeah, the heaviest weapon I ever got in my life was a slingshot. So <laughs> I don't think that no, that might not work. That actually might not work. But I don't think that it will do yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. So I came back to Spain. I left my bike. Uh, I had maybe ten days of break. So you left your bike where in in Morocco? No, in Spain. Oh, in Spain. Oh, you left your bike in Spain. Okay, sorry. Yeah. And uh, because I was passing through, I've done all the research on the buses, Mm -hmm. those long range buses that are Mm -hmm. going through Morocco. And surprisingly, I found a solution. So you said like, I'm not giving up easily. No, Uh, no, no. no, no. (laughs) So I decided that there is no point on going hitchhiking because Mm -hmm. it will just add extra time for me. Mm -hmm. And because of the language barrier, Mm -hmm. I'm not speaking French at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, so French, French would be the language to use. The there. language, yeah. They will be using Spanish around the Tangier area because mm-hmm. it's so close to Spain. Yeah. And then further, further s- farther south in Dakla because it used to be a Spanish colony. Mm-hmm. But French is the language to use. Mm. So, um, yeah, I went with ferry, then I took a bus uh, from Tangier to Casablanca. Mm-hmm. In Casablanca, I switched bus to 
Agadir. Mm-hmm. And from the Agadir, I managed to get a bus uh, to Dakla. So you're going the same same route again. And now for yeah. a comparison, how long did that take? Two days. Two days. Two days and, in the bus. And listen, was it like you were aware of that from, from day one, except you you want to do it on the bike? No, or no. I, you I never had an idea that you can get a bus. And those buses are really cheap. I think that... Right. Uh, so you would do that in the first place. You would go buy a bus if, if you only knew. Yes, Is probably. Is that what you're saying? Yes, okay. probably. Hmm. Hmm. It's only like 70 euros for a ticket from Tangier to Dakla over 2,000 kilometers. Wow. So it's not too bad. The problem is that you are spending two days in a bus, which is kind of crowded. So it's not like a comfy comfy air conditioned. It is. Oh, it is. Oh, that's not that bad. That's the company there called CTM. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are the proper bus company. Mm -hmm. Their buses are more expensive, Mm -hmm. but you know, you are always sure that the drivers are qualified. You're always sure that they are not tires. Uh, you have the air condition, mm-hmm. all the proper kind of. Oh, okay. It's like an airline, mm-hmm. airline, but going by bus. Yeah. You even have to register your luggage, uh, mm-hmm. check in your luggage. They will take it from for you, pack it to the bus right. for you, and then if you want to get it back, you are just showing the ID okay. and sticker you have for okay. your luggage. Okay, and so the proper. So I managed to land in Dakla. Mm-hmm. I met with uh, Karim. Again? Again, because he moved uh, to Dakla just to fish with us. Okay. Uh, for a few days, I stayed with his friend. Uh, I was waiting for my friend from Spain to join us. Mm-hmm. And for a few days, uh, we've been waiting for him together. Mm-hmm. We managed only, I think, two fishing trips in mm-hmm. those days because we didn't have a car. Okay. And we've been waiting for our other friend mm-hmm. for a car. So we found the beach mm-hmm. uh, that was promising. I saw the beach on some of the photos of other anglers mm-hmm. uh, getting the learfish. So I knew that, you know, it's kind of more or less the spot that we should be fishing at. Yeah. And the night before we went fishing, uh, Karim, he was telling me about this so-called camel fish. Yeah. I never heard about this fish before. And mm-hmm. he said, like, it's a really popular here mm-hmm. and he said it's really cool looking awesome fish but unfortunately you are fishing with uh, lures mm-hmm. it's impossible to catch this fish on a lure mm. karim is a hardcore bait angler okay. he's really like into bait angling you know mm-hmm. using sardines or crabs or worms yeah. stuff like this that's his territory he's not um, much into lure angling mm-hmm. And he said, like, you're just making things for you very difficult, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we went bait fishing, we'll mm-hmm. get a lot of fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, lure fishing, probably we got nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was telling me about this camel fish, you know. Mm-hmm. That's a great fish, uh, so often here, so powerful. And yeah. So we stopped on the beach. Uh, the last photo I had was probably just before 3 o'clock. Mm-hmm. It was him preparing a lunch. Mm-hmm. Then... The next photo is five past, maybe seven minutes later, with the fish. It was <laughs> the camel fish. It took a popper. <laughs> uh, apparently, camel fish is pompano. Okay. Which is quite common fish in yeah. the Western Africa. Yeah. And uh, yeah. one of the best lure fish you, <laughs> you can get. Yeah. yeah. Very good fish. They call it camel fish. They call this camel fish because of the hump on, yeah, on the back. Yeah. It's a local name. Never heard that name. Never heard yeah, it. Never heard it's anything. a local name in Dakla. Mm. Uh, hmm. And the same way, I think they called uh, learfish, uh, wolf fish. There. Wolf fish, okay. So the smash on the popper, you know, it was just like doing a pop, pop, pop. And then by the edge of the eye, you see, by the corner of the eye, you know, this shape appearing from the water. Mm. the ag- you know the aggression in the attack the first yeah. run was probably around 50 meters yeah and then i knew it's not a uh, learfish uh because you know everyone was always telling me if you get a decent sight learfish 150 200 meters that's the first run mm-hmm. every single time yeah so because fish stopped around maybe after 50 maximum 80 meters i knew that it's not a learfish mm-hmm. it's something different mm-hmm. 
really good fighter and i was really surprised too. they're they're unreal right those hot water like a like a fish that lives in the hot waters and the warm waters they're so aggressive and so yeah. like there's quite yeah. different uh, the, story you know like if you compare them to sea bass which is kind of oh, maybe i will take it maybe i will not uh, no, sniffing, it's like biting. It's, it's like no, no, no doubt. Th th they are just psychotic. They are there to murder. Like, and... like, yeah, like fishing for jacks. They're, you're sometimes yep. like a, one fish is hooked up, and the other fish is trying to rip the lure out of the mouth of the first yeah, fish. Yeah, they, yeah, they're still yeah. fighting. It's like, it's the same is happening with bluefish. Mm. Uh, every single time we got one, we've been always saying, you know, cast in that direction because there be plenty of other mm. following, and you know, yeah. you'll get a second hookup. Yeah, yeah. So I got that fish. And surprisingly, it was the only fish we got in 10 days fishing there. Oh. So not very good. Mm. Uh, we've been covering different places. Mm -hmm. uh, it took us a few days to learn the beach. Mm -hmm. You know, it, for Karim, it was kind of a new place. Mm -hmm. He fished there maybe once before. Yeah. And he's a bait fishing guy. So yeah. for him giving us any advice, you know, where to look for them, how to look for them, yeah. what time of the tide to look for them and yeah, where, yeah. was really difficult. Yeah, it is just not in that top type of fishing. Yeah, so it took us a uh, few days just to get the idea where those fish are, mm -hmm. how they are moving. The problem was we've been based in Dakla, our hotel was in Dakla, so yeah. every single day we had to drive from Dakla to the place which was around 90 kilometers. Mm -hmm. If you want to be there early, you have to drive by night. Mm -hmm. And the single most important thing that everyone hears once when going to Africa is don't drive in Africa by night. <laughs> <laughs> because you get camels, because you get trucks, because you get trucks without lights on. Mm -hmm. uh, we had few really dangerous incidents. So mm. we decided that no, it's not risk uh, driving at night. Mm. we've been leaving around first down yeah and you know once we've been reaching the beach it was around maybe nine o'clock so okay. we've been a bit too late mm. the other problem was from the place that you can reach by a car to the place that you can be fishing it was around three maybe four kilometers of walking through the sahara right so sand small dunes yeah uh, really soft sand yeah uh three four kilometers at least an hour yeah so once we've been getting there we've been really tired <laughs> oh, <laughs> fed up with everything yeah yeah and how long you stay there like ah uh, 10 days 10 we've days. been there for 10, 10 days, days. Uh, my friend from then... spain he flew for five days only mm -hmm. we managed only to get one pompano mm -hmm. we had few follows few hookups few mm -hmm. fish we lost few mm -hmm. fish that were following our lures mm -hmm. but because we've been too late because there was not much action yeah we never managed to get anything yeah. more yeah a positive thing we managed to find a guide local mm -hmm. one uh -huh. who's really specializing in catching lure fish mm -hmm. he has uh, all the campsites just on the shore of the beach mm -hmm. so it's so simple as uh, you know you're putting your crocs on mm -hmm. walking out of the tent walking maybe so where 100 is next meters. Time? so where's the next time you're going September. Okay, that's it's all planned. <laughs> yeah, we are going in September. <laughs> oh man, that's that's just awesome. And then, so after ten days or whatever you've been there, you just you just you know came back by bus. Came back by bus. Two oh, days man. extra by Moroccan bus. Yeah, that, that's adventure. That's that's, that's absolutely like like you know like your angler, your bike packer. And you're adventurer, like a proper one. I mean, like, man, that's yeah, a proper, that, that's, proper uh, adventure. That, that was the really funny thing, uh, because um, on my way back, there, there was a huge storm hitting Portugal and mm. Spain mm -hmm. that day. Uh, winds reaching 100 kilometers mm -hmm. per hour. Uh, luckily, it was going a bit different way. So it didn't went through the strait, it went through the Portugal. Uh -huh. But all the ferries were not going there. Mm -hmm. And I was stuck in Tangier because ferries from Tangier, because the port is shallow, they are small ferries which mm -hmm. are unable to go in the rough weather. Mm -hmm. And they told me, you have to go to Tangier Med again mm -hmm. <laughs> because the big ferry to Algeciras yeah. is going from Tangier Med. So I had to manage to get a cab 
mm-hmm. from Tangier to Tangier Med because there is no bus, no communication, nothing like this. And just getting a taxi in Morocco is adventure is, itself. Yeah, by its own. <laughs> and because those t- taxis are big, six people, seven people inside, mm-hmm. they, they are small vans. Yeah. Um, I decided that there is no point on me paying for the whole taxi. We are just mm-hmm. because it's so many of other travelers mm-hmm. stranded there waiting for a ferry. Mm-hmm. So I started uh, gathering people and said, I said, you know, I'm going to Tangier Met. I need five more people. Mm-hmm. So once I had the group, once I had the price agreed with the taxi driver and, and you know, it was all a go. Yeah. It was raining so heavily that day, like in Ireland, you are in Morocco and it's just pouring with rain mm-hmm. and because of the storm. Yeah. And then there is this guy coming with his daughter. She's maybe two, maybe three years old. And he's like, man, please, uh, can you give me your place in the taxi? Because I'm stuck here for so many hours. She's basically all soaked wet. I don't have clothes for changing everything. Mm -hmm. It's all waiting for us in Spain. Mm -hmm. And we are stuck in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. Uh, All my followers for my trip, they were already in the taxi because I was organizing the ride. I was the last one standing outside. Yeah. Okay, you know, (laughs) children first. So he packed to the truck and I was back to square one, you know, finding another group of uh, five people to share the taxi. Okay. But finally I managed to get to the ferry point. Okay. And I was chatting. Kudos to you, man. You gave him your your spot. But I was chatting with older couple there. Mm -hmm. They were from Spain. They were just visiting Morocco. Mm -hmm. And they were saying like, why you went so far? Just to get one fish. <laughs> you and don't said, understand, people. <laughs> and they said, and you are not even eating those fish. <laughs> and they were like, what's wrong with we have, you? We've been there. We've been there. Like, yeah. we got this covered, right? <laughs> this discussion. <laughs> yeah, so mm. at the end, they called me the Adventurista. <laughs> Adventurista, yeah. Yeah, uh, I can confirm that. And they are, they, they were laughing that uh, because in Polish, Mm-hmm. Uh, in Spanish is polaco. Yeah. yeah. And crazy in Spanish is loco. So they loco said polaco po- loco. <laughs> they said it's kind of it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I don't I don't know if you heard that it's a little bit of tangent but uh, my uh my friend who lives in in Barcelona which is Spain but it's not not Spain it's really. Catalonia. It's Catalonia. It's not Spain. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so they are actually um just wanted to, to not to butcher that, but I think is that that Catalonians calling Spaniards, or maybe it's Spaniards Catalonians, but I think that Catalonians calling Spaniards Polacos. Because it's a different way. Uh, it's the other way. Spaniards around. are calling Catalonians Polacos. But the other way around, yeah. It's really surprising uh, because uh, when you are telling that you are a Polaco. Yeah. They are always As, thinking that uh, you are from northern Spain, from <laughs> Catalonia. <laughs> they're, they're Catalonia. <laughs> and they are like, oh, mm, really, you don't speak Spanish much there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the proper Polaco. I'm, yeah. I'm like a real one. <laughs> oh, man, that's uh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic uh, adventure, man. I think that there is another important thing to the trip. Mm-hmm. Why I decided to go by the bike, finally, when I decided that, you know, bike is the answer. Mm-hmm. I decided to do this as a fundraiser. Mm-hmm. And um, there is this foundation in Ireland. Mm-hmm. They are called Aware.ie. Mm-hmm. And they, Our, like a one hour? H-O-U. No, like being aware of something. Or uh, aware, okay. Aware. Aware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. A-W, no, okay. So... Uh, they are the foundation helping people struggling with depression, mm-hmm. with bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really tough subject in Ireland. I think that mm-hmm. yep. it's being completely ignored by the government. Mm-hmm. And the time that you have to wait, especially in rural... Rural? rural. rural. Yeah, <laughs> that's the word. Especially if you are not living in a city mm-hmm. uh, to see a specialist yeah uh if you have any mental problems yeah depression yeah uh suicide tendencies yeah. things like this yeah you are waiting three months you are waiting six months yeah it's just a joke yeah. so our data they are providing 
really needed support in smaller towns, mm -hmm. bigger towns, cities, uh, support groups, uh, phone calls that you can call, yeah. intervention groups. They are providing all the valued support. So yeah. I decided that because myself, I'm dealing with depression for mm -hmm. years now, like mm -hmm. 10 years, nine years. Mm -hmm. I decided that it's really good to support them. Yeah. So I started a small fundraiser for the trip. Yeah. Uh, though the fundraiser is closed, uh, that's the thing that I would like to pass, pass yeah. through the podcast. Oh, that's a that's a. If that's you a, are that's able to help them, uh, they do have the fundraiser on their page. So please do. Yeah, we'll but, put a we'll put a, a link on the show notes, and uh, just when you're when you're talking about that, you know. We already spoke on the, on the mental health issue on the, on issues on the podcast before, um, and uh, by the time this episode airs, there's going to be another episode out uh, related to mental health and and so on. And I was uh, surprised with the response uh, to those episodes, which are you know like to me initially it was like, well, y you know, we're going to talk about how the outdoors does good to your mental health and and so yeah, on okay it's really important. and then man like a response was like tremendous i never expected that there were so many people you know responding and leaving comments and so on and so on on the episodes related to mental health so like you, you said it's it's it is a big problem in ireland this problem is completely ignored i think but by most of the society by government by health services mm -hmm. If you look at these statistics, depression is the number one killer of men younger than 45. Mm -hmm. Not car accidents, not heart diseases, mm -hmm. not cancer. Mm -hmm. It's suicide. Mm -hmm. Suicide, which is always linked with depression. Mm -hmm. Most of the times it's linked with mm -hmm. depression. Uh, Do you think it's because of the lack of the sun? Is, is because of the weather? Is obviously, it's it... one of the factors, but I think it's uh, just the general attitude uh, in the society. You have mm -hmm. to be a successful person. You have to reach for the stars. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Be the best. Uh, have Keep a mortgage. Keep up with the rest of yeah. the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think rat that race. as much as I really love Ireland and Irish mm -hmm. people, I think that the attitude, I'm fine... Mm -hmm. I'm happy. How are you doing? I'm mm -hmm. really grand. It's mm -hmm. not helping. Mm -hmm. The idea that people, from my perspective, as an mm -hmm. immigrant, as a Polish person in mm -hmm. Ireland, uh, Irish people are not very keen on having any deeper, more, more personal conversation yep. with their friends, with their colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think uh, it's really everything really very shallow, like uh, on the surface. And I like... wouldn't say this, but I think that there is a huge stigmatization and tabuization when it comes to mental health. Yeah, and that's a huge problem in our society. I agree. Here. That's that's again that's again kind of a reoccurring theme, you know, yep. that I that I heard like many times. And there's like uh, even uh, you know like a mental mental health hour on Twitter, and like there's a lot of people. That I think there's a like you're saying, uh, with the organization like AWARE and others, there is a this kind of like a grassroots movement, for the want of a better word, of people kind of and pushing and saying like, really hey. really happening. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Especially in Ireland, you live in communities and those small communities are always very close. Mm -hmm. uh, like even not being from Ireland, even being an immigrant. Mm -hmm. I'm really close with my neighbors, with friends of my sons, mm -hmm. uh, parents of uh, friends of my son mm -hmm. from school. Yeah. Last year, one of the fathers uh, committed suicide. Mm. One of the fathers in his class committed yeah. suicide. I think it's really impacting all the community mm -hmm. if such things are happening on a regular basis, basically. Mm -hmm. so yeah there is a lot of movement like every single year the St. Patrick Parade is opened by people hang going with a banner it's okay not to be okay yep. if you are in a trouble don't be afraid seek mm -hmm. advice yeah there's this this uh this cycle cycle against the suicide yes which is uh, a colleague of mine is one of the organizer of that that's why i started the, the, cycling because um mm. are you gonna are you, are you planning to take part in the cycling against the suicide 
next year. I never heard about this before. Oh, look <laughs> it, look, look it up, man. It's like a, uh, <clears throat> I think it's like a 10 day event. And, and you don't have to take part like very few people take part in the whole 10 day because they're like starting on the on the on the north and then, like they cover like a hundred kilometers every day ah that's something for me and they're going like a one hop 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 and they're going from that's north perfect. to south of ireland and along the way this is this they have this like orange shirts it's like a cycling against the suicide you know shoulder to shoulder Great it's idea. okay to not Great be okay idea. That's going on for a number of years. I think I think I I uh, you know I should have a gym on the podcast for to, sure to talk about the to talk about the the this event and uh, so look it up. Cycle against the suicide, Very going for many years, and this is exactly to to raise the awareness and and and, and see, kind of get the people out and do something. Because like like I mean like uh, what you're doing essentially, like. I, I think, and I don't know if you can confirm that, but I think that helps a lot that you're, that you get out and you do something, you do something crazy and you cycle, you know, through Morocco and you like, that kind of puts the perspective into everything else that's going on. And, and I think like not enough people have a, you know, quite frankly, balls to do that, but also other means. But the thing is, it's so simple. If you want to go cycling, you really don't need a super duper bike. You really don't need uh, to prepare yourself. You don't need any extra stuff, tackle. You just need to want to go outside. Yeah. You don't need you do, like you don't need to do that. Like you, you mentioned, like this keeping up with others. Like you don't need to have this latest no, carbon no, fiber no, 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 no. You bike really can with get, the fast wheels. You just you can like yeah. You really can just... get a bike from a shed from a shed. Mm. Except of my fat bike up until now my number one bike that i was cycling is 23 years old old steel marine bike mm. that my parents gave me when i was 13. Mm -hmm. yeah. so by any standard of modern cycling it's just vintage it and is. completely old it school is. it is it's working and i know that uh I trust this bike and even tomorrow we were we were looking at your bikes before we started recording yeah. they all steel bikes steel is for real man like yeah they are great real. <laughs> maybe a bit heavier but they are really good. Oh, who cares? but my point is uh, you don't need any extra preparation you don't mm -hmm. need uh, any extra stuff uh it's really affordable there are so many ways uh, if you look on the internet there is this eurovelo yeah. There are roads across the Europe that mm -hmm. you can travel. They are special cycle paths that you are safe mm -hmm. from the cars. No mm -hmm. one will hit you. Mm -hmm. um, you can cover thousands of kilometers yeah. by almost for nothing. You know, the cost is just so low. Most of the ferries will get you with your bicycle for a standard foot passenger mm -hmm. price because a uh, bicycle is not being considered a motor. Yeah. They will just get it for you for free. Yeah, uh, you can fly with your bicycle for, I think, forty euros with Ryanair. Mm -hmm. Anywhere mm -hmm. you want, and you can just get in your bicycle, start cycling, yeah. and you see how you will find out how much fun it is. No doubt, no doubt. And when it comes to depression, I think that it's really not good that people are ashamed of talking about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and the attitude that it's a mental problem so it's something that you can keep on like you know get yourself pull yourself together mm -hmm. stuff like this no it's a physical condition mm -hmm. it's the stuff in your brain not working properly the neurotransmitters in your brain not working properly if you are having diabetes mm -hmm. no one is coming to you and saying like you know get your act together and stop having diabetes <laughs> uh, that even sounds ridiculous doesn't it th that's my point but any person with depression will hear this so mm -hmm. many times in your life mm -hmm. yeah yeah and like it's you know what's your what's your view is it like becoming so um conditioned that is that people suffer so often in the recent time or is it just only in the recent time people start talking about it and it was going on for for a long time? Is it I like a, is it like a recently more or, or is it like yes? I think it's a recent. Uh, it's epidemic. Why and why? What's your lifestyle? I think that because mm. we are so separated from the nature. Ah, 
we are so separated from the outdoors. Mm -hmm. We are so separated from the real life that's going. Uh, we are so obsessed with uh, owning stuff. Mm -hmm. We are so mm -hmm. separated and alienated by mobile devices, social media. That shit is gaming, crazy. Uh, that's, that is crazy. And that's, again, something that is coming on the podcast over and over yeah. again. You know, like a switch off your damn devices. I even have a, another episode of the podcast. Again, it's, it's, it's going to be up by the time this one airs where we're talking about the digital detox. Where it's like you switch off your damn phone, man. That, like... That's what I, that's what I'm doing very often, mm -hmm. uh, and trying to switch off for a few days, mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. I'm running the pirate lures. Mm -hmm. I'm unable to do this permanently. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's really tempting. Yeah, listen, man. It it was a it was a fantastic conversation. You know, I, I'm 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 just wondering about the title of this podcast, but it's gonna be. <laughs> Uh, angling whether it's gonna be bike packing whether it's gonna be you know adventuring or like like with a with a uh very important message uh at the end about the mental health and uh and uh and, uh, and a fighting depression so just to summarize uh www.piratelures.com that's your website that's my website where people will be able to buy you know greatest lures in Hardly. ireland or in maybe ireland. in the world uh, that's one um then it's your uh, your your new instagram account one leg bikepacker one leg back bikepacker uh is it backpacker or bikepacker 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 that's the play of words that, that yeah. that's actually how we are describing this yeah uh traveling light by bike with small uh small bags attached to your yeah. bike yeah. instead of panniers heavy right yes Yes, the exactly. old days. Exactly. So it's one legged bike, bike packer. It's your Instagram account. Yep. And also uh, aware.ie. Aware.ie. That's a charity. Um, that and they really do the work. Mm -hmm. If you need help, they will mm -hmm. help you. If you can help, help them. That's, that's a, as simple as that. That's a powerful message, man. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for doing this. Thanks. Sir.